If I asked you to perform 23,000 absolutely terrible squats every single day, how do you expect that you would feel? You would probably expect that your knees, your hips, and your back would probably start to hurt, right? Well, when it comes to breathing, our big time muscle, the diaphragm, actually contracts over 23,000 times per day. And so if it's not in a good position, or if it's not executed correctly, then we would expect dysfunction to start to occur. The funny thing is, when we coach a patient to improve their diaphragmatic breathing, a lot of times we cue them to try to poof the stomach out and then to bring it back in. But in this video, I want to go over three reasons why I actually avoid that. And the three big reasons are number one, mobility restrictions, number two, premature fatigue, and number three, higher frequencies of neck pain. Before we discuss those reasons, I think it will be super helpful to quickly discuss what would be considered normal respiration. There's essentially three structures that I want you to familiarize yourself with. The first one we already introduced, and that is the diaphragm, our big time breathing muscle. Essentially, the diaphragm sits right around here and separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavity. It has attachments on the lumbar spine, in the rib cage, which means that the overall position of the ribs and the spine are going to influence the efficiency of the diaphragm. Now, when it comes to breathing, on inhalation, the diaphragm should descend down, and on exhalation, it should ascend back up. Now, the other two structures I want you to start thinking of are the sternum, which is also known as the pump handle, and the lower ribs, which is also known as the bucket handle. Now, what should happen as it relates to inhalation and exhalation, on inhalation, the pump handle and the bucket handle should both expand. The pump handle is going to expand anterior to posterior, so it's going to press on out three-dimensionally here. The bucket handle is going to expand laterally. Now, what's happening at the ribs is they're opening up. So if these are the ribs, they're going to open up or externally rotate. Now, on exhalation, it's just the opposite. So the pump handle and the bucket handle should start to compress. And what's gonna happen is the ribs are gonna move from their externally rotated position back into an internally rotated position. Now, this would be what we would consider normal. And when you start to coach belly breathing, that's when we move a little bit away from what we would expect to see. So that brings us to point number one, mobility restrictions. Based off what we just talked about, it should start to make sense that if we're only expanding and compressing and breathing through our stomach, that we're not getting the motion here as we typically would like to see. Over the course of time and 23,000 times per day that we're not moving the ribs, it would start to make sense that the ribs would become pretty rigid, right? They're not going through their normal opening and closing. And what happens is they're going to get tighter and tighter. But the problem also doesn't just stop there. The ribs are going to highly influence the shoulder and the scapula, but also the ribs and the spine with the attachment of the diaphragm is going to influence the pelvis. So not only do we start to see significant mobility restrictions at the rib cage, we start to see shoulder range of motion limitations. We start to see pelvis and hip range of motion limitation. What happens is when someone's just expanding and compressing their belly, they start to feed into a pattern. The pattern really drives a flared rib cage, an arched back and an anterior pelvic tilt. And what happens is the pattern becomes more dominant and more dominant the more that they're breathing and moving in and out of it. The problem is they can't really move out of it, right? If you're confused, arch your back, do an anterior pelvic tilt, try to rotate. You can't, right? So this pattern becomes so dominant and it's really driving through the belly breathing. So if we want to start to improve mobility, we need to first start at addressing the breathing. Point number two is premature fatigue. What I mean by this is that when we're only breathing through our stomach, we're not getting the lungs to move through their full range of motion and really to perform in their full capacity. The lungs like and really need to expand and compress to stay in a healthy state. Think about it. 
Look at any other part in the body and ask yourself, does it like to pump? Think about the heart. We all know the heart wants and needs to pump, right? The GI tract needs to pump, expand and compress. Our muscles need to expand and compress and pump. We need to move our arms and pump, right? We're all just a bunch of pumps. And really when we lose the ability to pump in an efficient manner, there is dysfunction. Think about all the parts and examples I just said. When the heart stops pumping to its full capability, we have a problem. When the GI tract can't pump to its full ability, we have a problem. When you don't move your arms when you're sprinting, we have a problem, right? So the body likes to pump. When it can't pump, we normally have dysfunction. And so what happens is we fatigue because we can't get the air that we need, right? So when you're walking or sitting, we're not getting the air that we need, but definitely on the exercise side, right? When we are not expanding the lungs, to keep up the demand with the oxygen, we get more and more belly breath and people prematurely fatigue. They get dizzy, they get lightheaded, right? So to fix this, we need to start finding strategies to allow the ribs to move so that the lungs can pump in their efficient manner. Our third and final point is higher frequency of neck pain. If you think about normal respiration, like we talked about, the diaphragm should be able to descend and ascend and air should be expanding and opening the ribs. But when we're just belly breathing, we're not getting that motion. So what do you think the next muscle in line to try to restore any sort of normalcy within the rib cage is going to be? It's going to be our accessory muscles, our accessory breathing muscles, AKA a lot of the neck muscles, right? The SCM, the levator scap, anything that has any sort of leverage to try to open and externally rotate the ribs. So what happens with the increase in belly breathing, we usually have an increase in neck pain, discomfort, tightness. Why? Because they are trying to contract 23,000 times per day to make up for the inefficient diaphragm and the inefficient movement. So when we start to restore normal breathing mechanics and get the ribs to move because air is getting them to do so, these types of patients don't have to work their neck so much. Sure, they'll still be working a little bit because as the accessory muscles, they're going to assist, but they, they move from a primary role to their true assisting role. And when you can do that, you can really help patients that are dealing with chronic neck pain. So it shouldn't surprise you that the first way we can start to address this is through an actual breathing drill. But the setup is really important and there's a couple of key strategies that we can use along the way to make it that much more successful. So I want you to take note of the position that I'm in. I'm on the wall, I'm in a sideline position, there's a ball between my knees and my head supported. Here's what we want to think about all of this. The overall sideline position is going to start to compress this rib cage. A lot of times patients that really just go through that belly breathing motion is because the bucket handle is not compressed enough. The nice thing about side lying is the side that's on the bottom gets very compressed because we're actually laying on it, but the effects of gravity and our position also start to compress this left bucket handle compared to if we're in a supine or a hook lying position. Now, super important to make sure your head is relaxed. Again, in point number three, we talked about how these types of people normally have increased neck pain or dysfunction, right? So we need to make sure that the neck is relatively off. And we can do that by just making sure we're in a neutral position. We're not arched too much or too far down. Feet on the wall, we want to ground our patient, right? And so what we can do is feet on the wall, and that just helps us get a better position of the pelvis so we can start to move that. And the knees are helping uh, with the ball to keep more of a neutral pelvis, right? And not, not in too much of an internally or externally rotated position at the femur. Now, when it comes to breathing, what you wanna think about is that the exhale and the inhale are both important, but you need a successful exhale to really drive the successful inhale. Now, I know that sounds simple, but it's actually a lot harder uh, than it sounds, especially for someone that's not used to doing this. So what you can do is you can use a balloon if you want. The balloon is just a dumbbell for your abs. It's going to provide more resistance 
so you can help to really drive the rib cage down, right? Because for here's the thing, we need to sufficiently bring the rib cage down and then we need to be able to maintain that position and then inhale. If and when we do that, that's when we're gonna get this pump handle to really expand three-dimensionally anterior to posterior and that's going to really help this person start to shift out of that belly breathing, right? So what you wanna do is you'll get grounded, make sure you're pretty much through your mid heel, mid foot and heel. We're going to get into a slight posterior pelvic tilt or tuck. Again, normally these people are in a pattern of an anterior pelvic tilt, so we're gonna go in the opposite direction. We're going to then cue them to exhale through their mouth as they exhale, if they're not using a balloon, I like to use a two breath rule. So essentially you take two exhales. It sounds like this, take an inhale, exhale, breath one. So that second exhale, you're just driving a little bit more to make sure that they feel their side abs. Once they feel their side abs, they're gonna hold that and then inhale. As they inhale, they must continue to feel those side abs. Really, really important. If they lose the side abs, that's because they're going to their belly. So they really need to be comfortable and confident and aware that as they inhale, they are getting that air to go up and they're feeling the pump handle expand. Then we would continue this for about three to four breaths. Once they're comfortable with the breathing, you can progress it by going to a side plank. This is just another way that you can challenge their breathing in a little bit more of a stressful environment, right? Because it's cool to be on our side and breathing in a calm state, but what happens when they're in an uncomfortable situation, i.e. exercise? So for the side plank, the breathing will be the same that we just talked about, but for a side plank, we're gonna really make sure that we drive this shoulder away from us, draw it back or retract that scap. We're gonna use this hand to really reference and as we go up, we need to feel these right abs in this scenario kick on. We're gonna go into a posterior pelvic tuck. And as we lift, the verbiage we use is really crucial. Don't just lift up. This is using our hip. We could do this all day long and barely feel our abs. We need to cue our patient in a very specific manner and say, I want you to lift your ribs so your hips come off the ground, right? So we are lifting the rib cage, continuing to lift as the hips come off the ground. You can see I'm starting to shake because I didn't lose those side abs. You can be here. If they are trying to extend their spine, we can reach. If they really can't feel here, we can add in a arm over the head to really maximize that side bend. And then from here, it would be our nice breathing. We're still getting this anterior to posterior expansion and working on the same breathing patterns just in a stressful environment.